the Northern Realms and the Nilfgaardian Empire, usually simply referred to as the North and the Empire. Conflict has always been a part of life between these two superpowers, the, at least mostly, United Empire trying to dig its claws into more northern soil each time. This conflict escalated into a full-on war twice. Even before the wars, Nilfgaard, or the Black Ones, so nicknamed for their black armor and cloaks, had been expanding its territory slowly. The Empire was much smaller before, until they expanded ever closer towards the Northern Kingdoms, annexing Ebbing, Maked, Metena and Nazaire. This puts the Nilfgaardian northern borders at Sintra. And it is Sintra that would feel the brunt of the attack each time. During the First War, Nilfgaard attacked first, provoking Sintra into an all-out battle on their own lands in the Marnadol Valley. The Sintrians were defeated swiftly. Eistursach and Kalantha, king and queen of Sintra, both fought at their soldiers' side, where Eist was killed in battle. Kalantha then gathered whoever was left and broke through the enemy lines back to their capital to make their final stand in what would become known as the Slaughter of Sintra, the Massacre of Sintra. At least in the north, in the Empire it was simply called the Battle of Sintra, and Sintra was now Nilfgaardian land. After these events, Nilfgaard, emboldened by their victory, marched onto Sodden. It didn't take long before Upper Sodden was in flames, and the people of Sodden made a stance to thwart the Nilfgaardian threat. That battle, again, was lost by the north. And so Nilfgaard marched on, seemingly unstoppable, leaving a path of destruction in their wake. However, Sodden would not be defeated so easily. During the Second Battle of Sodden, better known as the Battle of Sodden Hill, the Nordlings served Nilfgaard a resounding defeat. The mages of the north banded together and fought alongside the united armies of the north, Tamaria, Redania, Edirne and Kedwin, making their stand on the hill thereafter known as Sorcerer's Peak, or the Mountain of the Fourteen. As it was thought, fourteen mages died that day, fighting for the people. I haven't been here for a year, the Witcher muttered. I was in the north, but I heard the Second Battle of Sodden. Precisely. You'll soon see the hill and the rock. We used to kill that hill Kite Top, but now everybody calls it Sorcerer's Peak or the Mountain of the Fourteen. For twenty-two of them stood on that hill, twenty-two sorcerers fought, and fourteen fell. It was a dreadful battle, sir. The earth reared up, fire poured from the sky like rain, and lightning bolts raged. Many perished, but the sorcerers overcame the black forces and broke the power which was leading them. And fourteen of them perished in that battle. Fourteen laid down their lives. Every child of ours knows the names of the fourteen carved in that stone that stands on the top of the hill. Don't you believe me? Listen. Axel Raby, Triss Marigold, Atlan Kerr, Vaniel of Bruges, Dagobert of Vaux. Stop, Jurga. What's the matter, sir? You're as pale as death. Of course, only thirteen died. It was thought that Triss Marigold had also died that day, However, it was an unknown mage that had died, so horribly disfigured during the battle they could not be recognized. Stop. Please, stop. No, Geralt, I won't. After all, you want to know what happened there on the hill, so listen. There was a din and flames. There were flaming arrows and exploding balls of fire. There were screams and crashes, and I suddenly found myself on the ground on a pile of charred, smoking rags, and I realized that the pile of rags was Joel, and that thing next to her, that awful thing, that trunk with no arms and no legs, which was screaming so horrifically, was Coral. And I thought the blood in which I was lying was Coral's blood, but it was my own. And then I saw what they had done to me, and I started to howl. Howl like a beaten dog, like a battered child. Leave me alone! Don't worry, I'm not going to cry. I'm not a little girl from a tiny tower in Maribor anymore. Damn it, I'm Triss Marigold, the fourteenth one, killed at Sodden. There are fourteen graves at the foot of the obelisk on the hill, but only thirteen bodies. You're amazed such a mistake could have been made? Most of the corpses were in hard to recognize pieces, no one identified them. The living were hard to account for, too. Of those who had known me well, Yennefer was the only one to survive, and Yennefer was blind. Others knew me fleetingly and always recognized me. 
by my beautiful hair, and I... Damn it, I didn't have it anymore! Geralt held her closer. She no longer tried to push him away. They use the highest magics on us, she continued in a muted voice. Spells, elixirs, amulets, and artifacts. Nothing was left wanting for the wounded heroes of the hill. We were cured, patched up. Our former appearances returned to us, our hair and sight restored. You can hardly see the marks. But I will never wear a plunging neckline again, Geralt. Never. Twenty-four mages had fought that day, led by the remarkably talented Vilgeforts of Roggevein. After the battle was over, Vilgeforts also engineered the truce between the North and the Empire, which he hoped would turn into a permanent peace eventually. Little did they know, Vilgeforts had already betrayed the North a long time ago, and this peace would not last. Sing your ballads, Dandelion, sing them to everyone. Your lesson won't go to waste, and it'll come in handy, you'll see. Because mark my words, Nilfgaard will attack us again. If not today, then tomorrow. They're licking their wounds now, recovering, but the day when we'll see their black cloaks and feather helmets again is growing ever nearer. And he was right, of course. In a meeting at Haga Castle on the Pontar, between Visimir of Redania, Demavent of Edirne, Foltest of Temeria, Henselt of Kedwin, and Meave of Lyria, they discuss Nilfgaard's latest movements. The Empire stands at the Yaruga, and the North fears another war. They had heard of new and gifted Nilfgaardian commanders, those who crushed the uprisings in Metina and Nazaire, who rapidly broke up the rebels in Ebbing. They were itching to cross the Yaruga and prove that they have learned from the mistakes of their old marshals during the First War. Henselt, unfazed, notes that the Yaruga is still guarded by Erevel of Verdun's strongholds, Nastrog, Rosrog, and Bodrog. Meave, however, is not impressed with Henselt's bravado at all. Let us say, Meave of Lyria said suddenly, that they do not cross the Yaruga. Let us say that Nilfgaard will simply wait. Now let us consider, who would that suit? Them or us? Who can let themselves wait and do nothing? And who can't? The Northern Realms were plagued with Scoia'tael attacks. In Mahakam, the dwarves were rebelling, the dryads of Broccolon were growing bolder and bolder every day. The North was already at war. Civil war. And while their armies might be willing to fight elves, they would be less inclined to fight their own countrymen, the peasants, the guilds, the free towns. And worse yet, word had gotten around that the people living on the lands already taken by Nilfgaard have an easier life. Freer, richer, with more privileges. At the same time, the north was flooded with Nilfgaardian goods, much cheaper goods. In Bruges and Verdun, the Empire's coin was now preferred over the local northern currencies. Nilfgaard was taking with gold and goods that which they could not win with arms. The rulers of the north then decided to start a joint war to destroy the elves. Even the free elves of Dolblathana, which was still a human state at the time, and they had not joined the Scoia'tael in war yet. They would march on Mahakam, allow Erevel of Verdun to finally deal with the Dryads of Broccolon. They would support Kraken Crate of Skellige in ravaging the Nilfgaardian shore. A show of strength, that's what was needed. However, Foltest did not think this enough just yet. They needed to take back Sintra from the Nilfgaardians. To cross the Yaruga, be the first to attack while they don't expect it. Foltest argued that they, unlike Nilfgaard, had control of the river. They hold the supply routes and their flank was protected by Skellige, Sidaris and the strongholds in Verdun. In doing this, however, they would break the truce they had established after the First War. Nidamir of Cairngorm and Astarath Thyssen of Kovir would not back them in this fight. Ithane of Sidaris might also back out. Not to mention the already restless guilds, merchants, nobles and, of course, sorcerers would not agree to starting a war. And so they instead devised a plan that would show Nilfgaard as the aggressor instead. They would stage a Nilfgaardian provocation at Dol Angra against Edirne and Lyria. The small border conflict would have to suffice to win them the approval of all those against the war. The Sintrians, of course, still opposed Nilfgaardian rule as well, and the refugees had gathered themselves in Bruges under a man called Visigerd's leadership. Their army already was 8,000 strong. 
They too would join the fight if the North attempted to take Sintra back. Unless... Ciri returns and marries someone with different interests in mind. And so they ponder on the problem of the Lion Cub of Sintra. And after much deliberation, they decide that she must die. For reasons of state. Word of this meeting also reached Emirva Emrys, who quickly surmised what they might have discussed. He noted that Ethane of Sedaris was not invited, nor was Erevel of Verdun, Estherat Thyssen, Nidamir, or anyone from the chapter of wizards. Emir guessed correctly that they might try to provoke the Nilfgaardian troops at Dol Engra and sends Menno Kohorn there with an army, with the express order not to get provoked until Emir orders him to. He also orders him to inform the chapter of wizards of their king's meeting in an attempt to rile them up and disperse them so they might prevent another sodden hill. And so it was that Emir sent a large force to Dol Angra to patrol the border, where they clashed occasionally with Lyrian troops. Skoyatel attacked more frequently and unrest took the lands. No all-out war would happen, however, until Thanet Isle. During the Sorcerer's Convention on Thanet Isle, the betrayer, Vilgeforts, had planned to take out the mages siding with the Northern Kingdoms. He even attempted to recruit Geralt to his cause, although his true motives were, of course, to find Ciri. And he would indeed find Ciri at Thanet that day, during a meeting between several of the most powerful sorcerers in direct service of the Kings of the North. Yennefer suddenly appeared, with Ciri in tow. And Ciri, in a trance, began to tell them of what had transpired at Dol Angra. Last night, said the medium, armed forces in Lyrian livery and carrying Adurnian standards committed acts of aggression against the empire of Nilfgaard. Glavitsingen, a border outpost in Dol Angra, was attacked. King Demovan's heralds informed the people of the surrounding villages that Edurn is taking control of the entire country from today. The entire population was incited to rise up against Nilfgaard. Emperor Emir Va Emrys has given the order to answer blows with blows. Nilfgaardian forces entered Lyria and Edirne at dawn today. At this point, Sabrina Glevesig furiously asks Philippa why Demovent attacked so soon, why he couldn't restrain himself as this was not what they had decided on. Tessiad of Rhys then wonders out loud why Henselt of Kedwin's army is also concentrated on the border, why full test of Temeria's forces are launching boats to cross the Aruga? Why Vizimir of Redania's forces stand ready at the Pontar? Philippa and the other sorceresses serving the kings of the north had attempted to stop the kings from starting this war so soon, but they had failed. And the north, so it seemed, had provoked the empire. However, Ciri was not done talking just yet. King Vizimir, interrupted the fair-haired medium, in an unemotional voice, was murdered yesterday evening, stabbed by an assassin. Redania no longer has a king. At this point, Tessiad of Rhys lifted the blockade that prevented spells from being cast and stunned the northern sorcerers while freeing Vilgefortz and Francesca Findebear, the biggest mistake she could have made. Francesca then opened the entrance to the cellars and Thanet Isle was suddenly swarming with Scoyatel, Sorcerers and sorceresses alike started dying around them, as it was now clear that Vilgefortz and Francesca had allied themselves with Nilfgaard. And it was not just the northern sorcerers that had planned an attack. The Second War had started. The war had started in all earnest now, and things were moving fast. Thanet Isle had divided the mages into two camps, and many others were dead. Nilfgaard attacked Lyria and Edirn, and swiftly destroyed the border fortresses of Lyria, Spala and Scala. And while Rivia was prepared for months of siege, they surrendered after only two days, under the demand of the merchants and guilds. So Nilfgaard, without resistance, marched on to Eldersburg, where Demovend and Meave decided to go to battle to prevent a blockade. But they lost. Miserably. Nilfgaard then applied the scorched earth tactic as they marched on, taking everything of value and destroying what was left. From the Yaruga to Vengerberg, the lands burned, and Vengerberg itself fell after only a week. The merchants fought until their last breath, and after they were defeated, 
Nilfgaard hunted refugees to use as slaves. If you thought the Northern Kingdoms might work together at this point, you're mistaken. No one came to help Edern. Redania was in turmoil after the assassination of Vizimir, carried out by an assassin sent by Vilgefortz, and Dijkstra was too busy organizing executions everywhere and hunting Scoia'tael and Nilfgaardian spies. Foltes did not help after Emir sent a messenger to Vizima, offering a peace treaty. Foltest accepted this treaty as Nilfgaard would soon have an opening to attack past Hage. As Edern fell and to the south, King Ervil of Verdun had allied himself with Nilfgaard, opening the fortresses on the lower Yoruga, and Henselt of Kedwin took the scraps of Edern that Nilfgaard so graciously awarded them for not joining in the war. Henselt planted his banner at the River Diffney and took Upper Edern, bordering Dolblathana, now an independent elven state. King Demavent, meanwhile, took refuge in Tretagor Redania, cursing Henselt all the while as the commanders of Kedwen and Nilfgaard shook hands over the bleeding and flickering kingdom of Edern and sealed it with robbery and sharing of loot. As said, after the fall of Vengerberg, the elves took back Dolblathana when the governor of Vengerberg fled. However, in giving the elves Dolblathana, Emir had ordered them to condemn the actions of the Scoia'tael and terminate all connections. That was Henselt and Foltest's condition in accepting Dolblathana as an elven state. At this point, Emir was not directly at war with Kedwin yet, and he had just signed a peace treaty with Foltest of Temeria. However, immediately after taking Edern, Emir broke that pact and took Bruges and Sodden. By playing the coward, Foltest only bought himself two weeks of peace. The fortresses of Mayenna and Razvan had fallen, the Temerians were defeated at Maribor, and the city itself was under heavy siege. But now, Nilfgaard had stretched their supply lines and their flank was exposed. Before winter, they would be forced to break their siege and withdraw to the Yoruga. When spring appeared, however, they would again launch an all-out offensive. Their main force would attack Temeria, the Pontar River, Novigrad, Vizima and Elander. This central force would be led by Menno Kohorn, while the eastern flanking armies, led by Ardal Ebdahi, would strike from Edern's Pontar Valley and Kedwin, as Emir had tolerated Henselt long enough by now, and they needed to prevent Henselt from sending troops to aid Temeria. From the western flank through Verden, led by Joachim the Wet, another army would attack and control Sidaris, and in doing so, blocking off Novigrad, Gorsvelen and Vizima. These cities would then of course be under siege for a very long time. This attack would include over 300,000 people, not counting elves as the Scoia'tael also allied themselves with Nilfgaard. Redania at the time could only muster 35,000 soldiers and 4,000 heavy cavalry. However, Demavend and Meave had an army like that and Emir broke it in 26 days. And so, Dijkstra of Redania visited Kovir in hopes of returning with money or mercenaries, or both, of course. To his surprise, Estera Thyssen invited him for a meeting where he informed Dijkstra of the terrible position the North was in. Unfortunately, Kovir and Nilfgaard had long ago signed a treaty which prevented Kovir from providing the enemies of Nilfgaard with military aid, neither money or troops and Estherat knew very well that Nilfgaard had informants in his cities as well. However, after a night of thinking and discussing things with his wife, Estherat decided that it would not be breaking a treaty if he had someone else give Dijkstra the money he required. And so it happens that Redania mysteriously obtained the money to hire a great many mercenaries. And there were a lot of mercenaries to be had, as Estera Thyssen had also very mysteriously decided to grant a royal pardon to all prisoners in Kovir. In the meantime, smaller battles were taking place all over the Northern Kingdoms. Over the lumber of Angren, which both parties wished to control, Queen Meave of Lyria, who was never captured or killed during the invasion into Lyria and Edern, had formed a band of guerrilla fighters to attack Nilfgaard wherever they could, including one wild battle that included Geralt and his company. And Anna Henrietta of Toussaint was still under the impression that there was, in fact, no war. However, the tide of battle was about to turn on Nilfgaard, 
as one of the three armies set to take Temeria wasn't quite doing what it was told. Duke de Wet, leading the Western Army, was to attack and control Sedaris, as we know. This would block off Novigrad, Gorsvelen and Vizima. However, instead of marching straight for Sedaris, the young Duke decided to focus his efforts on the Verdanian guerrillas who had not yet accepted Nilfgaard as their sudden ally. At first, there were but a handful of guerrillas. However, as the Nilfgaardian army marched on and fought them left and right, committing unspeakable atrocities against the civilian population in the process, the guerrilla army grew ever larger as Verdun rose up against their oppressors, until eventually they outmatched the Nilfgaardians and the roles were reversed in favor of the Verdanians. Ervil, the king so eager to appease Emir Va Emris, was overthrown and replaced with his son, Kistrin, who led the rebellion. This, in turn, stopped the Western Nilfgaardian army from coming to Menno Kohorn and the Central Army's aid. Kohorn was now tied down and could advance no further. The North saw an opportunity to attack, and so they did, breaking through the encirclement near Mayenna and Maribor. Instrumental in this victory were, of course, the Redanian mercenaries bought with Kaviri funding. The companies of Adam Pangrat, Lorenzo Mola, Juan Quiteras and Julia Abatamarco tipped the scales at Mayena and it was mainly thanks to them that the Nilfgaardian lines were broken. Together they now formed the Free Company. This same company along with a now united Northern Kingdoms, the Mahakam Volunteer Army and many more volunteers, inspired by the recent victory, marched to Vizima to take part in the upcoming battle at Brenna. Menno Kohor now also marched towards Brenna along the river Ina. He reached Brenna with 46,000 soldiers. Meanwhile, the northern armies were divided as such. Redania's royal corps, led by Graf de Ruyter, were 8,000 strong. The main forces of the army consisted of both Temerian and Redanian infantry, 12,000 strong. 3,000 more Vizimian and Mariborian foot soldiers, better known as the PFI, or Poor Fucking Infantry, led by Bronnebor, flanked the central unit. The right wing of the army were formed by the volunteer regiment of Mahakam, eight companies of light horses and the Free Company, commanded by Adam Pangrat and Barclay Else. It is unknown how many soldiers this unit counted, however it likely wasn't enough to make up the otherwise 23,000 unit difference when compared to the Nilfgaardian army. The north was heavily outnumbered. However, Kohorn did not attack after several hours of waiting. He was, in fact, waiting for his scouting patrols to return and report. Little did he know that his scout of choice, Lamar Flo, was a terrible coward. Kohorn wanted to know what might be hidden behind the hills to the north. He had a bad feeling about them. But Mr. Flo was ill-inclined to investigate beyond those hills entirely, and so he reported back to Kohorn that there was absolutely nothing over those hills, without actually confirming whether there was. And so, Nilfgaard's cavalry charged, and the battle began. The Nilfgaardian cavalry impaled themselves on the pikes of the Central Northern Army Group. The Elba Division cut down everything they met, creating a path towards the Temerian infantry, but they couldn't quite reach their goal. They got stuck in the horde of foot soldiers, they were dragged from their horses and crushed under clubs and pikes, and the Alba division was no more, taking many Nordlings with them in death. On the left wing and center line, Nilfgaard broke on the royal army of Maribor, Vizima and Tretigor, and the Landsknechts. On the right wing, however, the north was losing ground. The Free Company came to the aid of the Brugian army, but they paid a heavy price. But meanwhile, the Mahakaman volunteer army was surrounded, and this threatened to cut the northern army in two. John Natalis noticed this danger too and sent a messenger to the dwarves, ordering them to pull back before they were cut off entirely. And although the dwarves were at this point entirely surrounded, they followed those almost unfollowable orders anyway. Forming up in a square and moving together as a square, they marched to join the rest of the army again, accompanied by a division of the Free Company like a Roman battle formation. The Vrijheid Brigade subsequently breached the front lines and launched a cowardly attack on the hospitals and wounded there, and the reserves in the form of the PFI were sent in to join the battle soon too, but things still looked grim for the North. That is, until... 
From behind the hills Cohorn's scout didn't investigate as thoroughly as he should have, suddenly marched another 10,000 Redanian, Edernian and Cadwenian horsemen, led by General Blenheim Blenkert. They thundered down the hills, charging the Nilfgaardians who, while they tried to form a tight front to counter them, could not do so, as the Reuter launched a suicide attack on their flanks to prevent them from forming up. And the North started to turn the tide, all because Lamar Flo could not muster up the courage to check behind the hills. At this point, Cohorn sent everything he had left. Following the breach the Vrijheid Brigade had created, he sent in the 7th Derlian and the Nausicaa Brigade in an attempt to break through and sow panic among the northern lines. But to everyone's surprise, they were stopped in their tracks by none other than the PFI, the poor fucking infantry. Sheep herders and volunteers without experience, they held firm and the cavalry broke itself upon their spears. At that moment, Nilfgaard broke as well. On the left wing, they started fleeing. On the right wing, the dwarves and the free company finally overcame Nilfgaard's assault and they cried out in triumph, renewing the northern spirit and crushing the Empire's knights. Cohorn understood that he had lost the battle as he saw his men dying and running around him. His officers ran for him with a fresh horse and urged him to flee. When he noted there was nowhere to run, one of his officers dressed up in Cohorn's armor and led the enemy away as Cohorn attempted to flee. He did not get far. Although he almost made it out of the enemy ranks, he unheroically choked on the swampy marshes bordering the battlefield, struck down by Zoltan Chive and his brothers in arms. And with that, the North put an end to the Empire's march north. 44,000 Nilfgaardians died or were taken captive that day at Brenna. And after the battle, John Natalis immediately rode south, as of course there were yet more of the Empire's armies to crush. The Free Company took care of the belated rest of the Third Army, which Cohorn didn't bring in favor of speed. And at this news, the rest of the Central Army group took flight, hounded by Foltest and Natalis, who were close on their heels. Nilfgaard lost many more convoys and entire siege engines, previously meant to besiege Vizima, Gorsvelen and Novigrad. In the west, Duke Duet's armies in Verdun were constantly attacked by Skellige pirates and King Athane of Sidaris, the same Sidaris Duet was meant to take. And when Duet realized that Foltest and Natalis were now marching for him, he immediately fled to Sintra as well, as the strongholds bordering Sintra, Nastrog, Rosrog and Bodrog, still held firm. In Edern, news of the victory at Brenna reached as well, leading to Henselt and Demovent shaking hands and taking up arms against Nilfgaard together. And this unified front proved too much for the eastern Nilfgaardian army, led by Duke Ardal Abdahi. When eventually Redania and Queen Meave's rebels also came to their aid, Duke Ardal fled to Aldersburg, where he wanted to stand strong for a final battle. However, mysteriously he fell ill and died within two days, granting Henselt and Demovent another victory. Not long after, the kings of the north, as well as Dijkstra for Redania, and a representative of Nilfgaard met in Sintra. They were joined by the sorceresses of the lodge as well, secretly of course, and the meeting was led by Cyrus Engelkind Hemelfart, hierarch of Novigrad, a neutral party. It is here that these parties sign what will be known as the Peace of Sintra. There's a great deal of bickering about who gets to keep Upper Edern, and whether Dolblathana is to be a free elven state. Henselt is entirely opposed to relinquishing those lands. However, as we know, it is mostly sorceresses that decide what really happens in the end. Sabrina Glevesic notes that she'll make him see reason. Unfortunately, it was also decided that the Scoyatel were sold out. The commanders of the Scoyatel units serving under Nilfgaard were handed over to the north and executed. All but two, of course. Isengrim Falcherna and Jorveth both escaped. Nilfgaard made a great many concessions indeed, giving up the Scoyatel commanders, releasing prisoners of war, repayment of spoils and returning land to the original owners, removing Nilfgaardian settlers in the process. However, Emir simply wanted peace and he wanted it quickly. During the Nilfgaardian campaign in the Northern Kingdoms, they had of course burned a lot of their farmland, they had destroyed their industry. And now, even though the North had won the battle, they had not won the war. They were now forced to buy goods from Nilfgaard, 
but those goods could only be sold to the north in times of peace. And so Emir pushed for peace at all cost. Granted, he was influenced by the Guild of Merchants in this case, too. Emir, of course, also married the fake Ciri and kept Sintra in this way. The Free Company and the Dwarves, of course, were lauded by the people, but disdained by the kings and priests. The Scoia'tael, of course, were scattered and disorganized, scraping by for food. The Sorceresses, of course, continued scheming as they do. And so a new war was sure to happen one way or another, in a not-so-distant future. Could it have been prevented altogether if Demavend had gotten Foltest's message about postponing the war, as the sorceresses had asked? We'll never know, as the messenger got shot, but it's very unlikely. Would Nilfgaard have fought as long as they had if the Scoia'tael knew they were to be sacrificed for the greater good? Perhaps. Perhaps not. All we know for certain is that, at least for now, the war was over.